600 megahertz and the transition for television and the impact on wireless mics, it's not something that's talked about a whole lot, but I think a lot of people in the industry feel that pain. I'm just wondering if anyone has heard of this issue. Uh, and of those folks, how many people have actually started to plan a transition? And how many people have actually bought some new stuff? Interesting. Okay. Um, so tonight's talk, uh, we're going to go through three uh, speakers, uh, Colin, uh, Ike Zimbel, and uh, Rob Reddy. And then afterwards, we'll maybe get a chance to um, have a, a little um, panel discussion if there's time. If not, we'll just do a little quick Q&A. Um, so first speaker, Colin Bernard. Colin, Colin is with uh, Electrosonics. This is the Director of Operations based out of Toronto. Uh, Colin joined OC Alexander in 1980, which became Sennheiser in South Africa in 1985. Uh, Collins worked for TC Electronic in Montreal as a manager of professional division and then manager for the pro division for Sennheiser Canada. He then moved to Toronto in 92 and with the advent of live musicals, multi-channel wireless mic needs, Colin has assisted three, uh, theater and in international sound designers touring sound companies uh, with frequency coordination on several large 48 channel wireless mic systems which all launched in Toronto. Then he moved to New York's Broadway, uh, including rag Ragtime and Showboats, multi-city USA tours, plus supported Come From Away and Cirque du Soleil's Paramore uh, New York shows from Electrosonics. Uh, he consulted Solotech for the Céline Dion's first 1994-95 tour, uh, frequency coordinated Phantom of the Opera's 94-95 uh, world tour, and uh, then launched uh, Electrosonics Canada in 2006. Um, Tony's obviously got a ton of experience in, in the wireless space. As a result, um, uh, he uh, recently acted as a chairperson on the specially, special advisory group for the R RABC, which is the Radio Advisory Board of Canada, consulting with ICED in regards to the 600 megahertz uh, 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 transition and how that's going to impact um, wireless microphones. Um, from that, uh, documents were issued from ICED, uh, RSS-123 and RSS-210. Um, please welcome me in joining Tony to, uh, to have the, or, sorry, Colin. That's okay. Colin, uh, <laughs> have this discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, it's so funny, I was going before this discussion through uh, cleaning up my garage and I literally found this lanyard which kind of um, reminded me how long this whole white space device versus 600 meg <coughs> battle started or first started. So that was in 2013 um, where I was invited to go to uh, Ottawa and was very surprised to see uh, ourselves and sure, not surprising there, but everyone else was from Microsoft and Google and all the big corporates um, and the big plan was uh, basically white space devices that would operate in our space. Um, it's turned out that that hasn't been the case, um, which is the good news. There, there has been some application for white space devices, but certainly not what we feel is a threat. I know Rob will expand upon that, um, but it, it is certainly something that we need to mention. Um, mobile obviously wants to deploy as soon as they can into the six to 700. And so that's how this whole repack um, started. Um, the latest update, and I tried to give you as much up to date to, to, to today, in fact, is September 19, 2019. I got this from Kirk Nesbitt from the CAB. And this is the status of the current transition right now of where we are in terms of phase Three and four were successfully completed. Um, as he says, the next Canadian stations will transition to new channels. Um, let me just get to that slide. Um, so it's happening. I mean, the question is, each region will be different. And, you know, we don't want to get too deep into this. But they are deploying. The bottom line for us really is that an auction began, um, and the auction is complete. So this wording is extremely important. Um, we're not trying to scare anyone, um, but that's, you know, it's very apparent that 
the auction is complete in the way. This is from ICIT's website. So any license exempt, well firstly, anybody have licensed wireless microphones? Okay, that's what I figured. So most of the industry did not license their microphones. So we have approximately 60,000 wireless mics, <laughs> including House of Worship in the market. So what, what ICIT has simply done is they've said uh, anyone that, excuse me, did not have a license um, has to start vacating when the auction is complete. And the auction is now complete. The auction was much quicker than we, we thought. Um, the big bidders were Rogers and uh, Telus. Surprisingly, Bell um, aggressively bid and then pulled out of the auction. So they bid the price up. Um, and um, but that auction is now complete. So theoretically, then on paper, as far as Ottawa is concerned, um, the auction is complete, and we should start vacating out of that bandwidth. Um, there are a couple of exceptions, um, which we'll get into, and I know I can Rob will touch on this too. Um, up in the uh, what they call the du duplex gap in the guard band, um, and we'll get into that in, in more detail. Um, the document that covers unlicensed microphones for you to refer to, and I made sure that I had links on here so anyone who gets copies of this can dig in, you know, to these documents. But RSS, RSS 210 basically is the document that covers unlicensed wireless microphone use in Canada. And um, the decision and final technical policy and licensing framework for wireless microphones, I included that link too, which, which is um, extensive. Um, but the bottom line is, um, if you look at the previous, the um, 614 to 698 um, is the transition that we have to move out of. I, you know, some of these slides could be 20 minutes just for the one slides, but we're just trying to highlight what RSS 210 uh, covers. And again, that affects our 470 to 608 operation of wireless microphones, which is the UHF band. And so any unlicensed use from 470 to 608 can continue uh, as long as you're not above 608. Um, the latest decision that took a long time that I was involved in quite extensively actually um, combined with the broadcast industry and um, we lobbied very hard for more spectrum, if you're taking away, what are you replacing? You know, give us some options, some viable options for broadcast in particular and any other pro user. So uh, fortunately, we were hoping that we would see this document before this presentation and in fact, it literally did pop up um, about a week or 10 days ago. So that's the link to RSS 123. What I've got to stress is RSS 123 is for license only operation. So this is a new document or a, 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 a modified document for license only operation. And that's the description of the license um, document that would pertain to this. Um, basically it says the requirements to obtain the license, da 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 da, um, is covered in this document, RSS 123. CPC 2 1 1 1, that is the actual license document, etc. But the only eligible people who can apply for this license, and this was a fight, <laughs> but this is what I said, uh, you know, basically ended up <coughs> as a description. Again, this is straight from their website. So, broadcasters, other program producers, large venue operators and owners, professional sound companies and theater, music, sporting venues, <coughs> and any other similar event organizations that require high quality audio wireless mics as part of their production or events. Um, that, that does not include House of Worship. Anybody from House of Worship? In, yeah, so, they, you know, that was, that was a, um, a real issue. Um, but. They were quite emphatic, and that's the result. So this does not include House of Worship. Um, the bandwidth that interests us in particular, and the big fight, uh, the fight's over, was my, um, at, you know, representing the wireless mic industry, somebody had to do it, was to try and get Industry Canada to harmonize as much as possible with the FCC in the USA 
and the USA uh, have different laws, obviously, to industry, industry Canada's. They, they call it Part 74. But under Part 74, which is the broadcast um, law that pertains to broadcast use of wireless mics, for that description, quite similar, which is broadcast film TV production in the USA, um, the FCC did agree to this bandwidth that I highlighted in yellow. Mm -hmm. And so 941 to 960 uh, for specialized wireless microphone use. I put it in yellow because this literally only just happened. We can only apply for certification once ICID actually publishes something publicly, which is what, what has just happened the last week. Um, as far as electrosonics is concerned, we immediately, obviously, um, have started to apply for certification process for the 941 band. Um, but as I stressed, in the USA, they've already been uh, active in this band and, and quite successfully, actually. We've been watching it very closely. So I did look at scans from New York, from LA, from news teams traveling right across the USA, and they, they send their scans in. And it's been pretty, pretty good. Um, the big objection in Canada was the, from the STL, or what we thought were studio to transmitter link type active links. And I remember even speaking to see Keith is here tonight. Uh, a lot of those STLs are just not um, active anymore, and 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 though they they were in that bandwidth, what what is interesting is a lot of the licenses for those STLs um, are still active. But what's happened in the USA and here too is a lot of these corporate companies just renew their licenses, not knowing that their field uh, engineers are not using those STLs anymore. So. Um, this is something we're going to investigate more in Canada, obviously, as we get certification and as these news teams travel across Canada. Uh, the the, the um, 941 um, band, again, we stress, was primarily for ENG news type <coughs> operations that travel right across the USA and do not, and, and would be the same in Canada, that do not necessarily have have time to uh, register themselves in you know, the white space database. We'll, we'll get into that database more extensively. Um, this is just a brief, um, and, and I know Rob will probably cover more of this in depth, but this was the compromise from Industry Canada as well as the FCC in, in the USA. Um, I've got to stress we're very skeptical about these gaps that they've provided it. As you can see, there's downlink uh, information and uplink information that are very close and adjacent channels right next to um, where uh, any wireless mic would deploy here. Plus what they did was reduce the power, and that's a new law that's coming. So even though we'd have access to these bands, it would be a maximum of 20 milliwatt EIRP, not even effective radiated power, but EIRP. So 20 milliwatt is very, very limited. Um, I know we pushed as well as, um, I see Dan's here, Zenheiser pushed as well and said it should be at least 50 milliwatt. Um, and unfortunately, that's the battle we, we did not win. And it's the same in the USA. The slight difference in Canada was in the green section, those are what, are what they call voluntarily licensed and license exempt. Um, so you can voluntarily license a microphone in that bandwidth. Um, and but subject to a non-interference basis. In other words, if you get interfered with, you, you're on your own. Um, license exempt is in the orange area, and that's a very, very small bandwidth, 617, 614 to 617. So um, as far as we're concerned right now, we are not investing uh, at all into this um, until we see the transition complete, and we'll do tests on how um, these carriers behave and, and that's LTE, right? Mobile, that's pretty strong carriers on either side of you. So, um, I mean, this is really what has, has, you know, why did Rogers and TELUS and many others, Verizon, T-Mobile in the States spend so, you know, such high um, dollars on an auction of public uh, airspace? Um, well, that's another subject. It's, it's the propagation is so excellent if, you know, uh, in that frequency band, uh, the, the frequencies tend to get around corners easily, around pillars. Um, it's ideal, what we call beach real estate. 
anyhow, the beach real estate is still there. It's just somewhat diminished, but you know, it's not all bad news. The sky is not entirely falling. So this 470 to 608 wideband um, is where we are extremely active. Um, obviously, other microphone manufacturers are also coming out with digital type technologies. Uh, ours in particular is 24-bit 48K, um, 8PSK, which, which tracks right over the, that whole band. So the 470 to 608, it'll automatically set itself up accordingly and take everything into account from the receivers. Uh, that includes digital IFB now, obviously, of course, <laughs> which uh, CBC is now deploying and, and others. Um, as I say, not all bad news. We, we recently helped on a, a tour. Um, um, I can't say exactly who it is. It's a, it's a high-profile Broadway. It starts with an L and ends with a K. Oh, well, two words. Anyhow, they're on tour at 48 channels. Um, but that was, had to be calculated as post-auction um, in that 470 to 608 bandwidth. I wanted to show the frequencies for that, but I don't think the sound company would, uh, would appreciate that. But it is on tour right now, and again, the band planning of that was done all post-auction. So that is something that is, um, is touring right now in that 470 to 608. Um, I also included a, a, a slide which I thought, because I'm sure, I think I noticed in Rob's uh, slides, he's going to show this in more detail for Canada. So I thought I'll show this for the USA, which is basically um, how they differ slightly in terms of the duplex gap. And, um, you, you know, but it, it doesn't change the fact that you've got those very high power carriers on either side of you, adjacent, right next to you, um, in the USA too. So, um, the USA basically, in the green section, you know, see if this pointer works, um, that's a very small section there for, for licensed mics use. And, um, as you can see, that gap there, is extremely tiny, so... Um, How wide are the guard band? The guard band? Yeah. Um, they should show it here. Um, it's very small. Um, the guard band is one megahertz in that, in that region there. So, very interesting to see how that's going to, you know, going to develop. <coughs> But things are improving. I mean, manufacturers like ourselves and, and others have invested heavily in uh, software that can cater to smaller spectrum and doing scanning and setting things up very quickly. The, uh, uh, the software available is, is, is uh, we have an engineer almost full time on developing and making sure that that software is as accurate as possible. And you do your scan from your receiver and it automatically selects the channels for you in whatever, if you're operating again in that 470 to 608, for instance, and it, you then just sync your transmitters to those selected frequencies that it selected for you. Um, these programs, uh, one of them is, is IAS, which we use extensively, and that's used a lot by uh, independent sound people as well as Super Bowl and that level of, um, uh, of program. It's, it's, a, it's um, actually marketed by professional wireless systems um, who was um, the gentleman who actually developed that program has been in the trenches for years touring and going from stadium to stadium so there's a lot of good information there um, it compares obviously to sure workbench and Sennheiser has a program too etc um, what we're trying to do is to make sure that those files from workbench and other text files and ours is a I, th I think a CSE format, but that we can also import those uh, into our program if necessary. So if you had a particular wireless system that was successful in a certain location and you want to keep those frequencies but add new frequencies, you can just simply import that into our program or vice versa into other programs like, like um, the other two manufacturers and others. But that's generally um, the three manufacturers that are, are uh, investing most in this is ourselves, Sennheiser, and sure, you know. And I, th I'm, I don't know how much time I have left, but... You're good, if you want, if you have more to say. I do. Yeah. Um, so, if and when you ever hear any sort of um, uh, white noise <laughs> or white space device type um, scenarios where people have said, oh, well, white spaces are, 
we have not seen a deployment of white spaces in Canada. We have to stress that there's been uh, a small deployment in certain areas, which is point-to-point -point type um, or for uh, digital type display. You know, like good, you know, if you display in something in a shopping center, for instance, you can send a wireless signal to that display, for instance. Um, but I, the, the thing to stress, and, and what I'm still, and, and, and the industry is still waiting for Industry Canada to um, develop, and it's, it's taken much longer than we thought, is that essentially what needs to happen in Canada is what has happened in the USA, is there is a database for white space devices in, um, in operation, and each town has what we call SBEs, coordinators in every city, um, who are responsible. If you've got a certain sporting event in, in that uh, city, you would log in via your SBE um, to that database and actually tell that database where you are physically, what event you, you uh, and what frequencies you have. And it'll automatically then make sure that the white space devices, if they ever do you market them as much as they say they would, um, will automatically recognize that there is a, um, a wireless mic in operation. That's in theory. So um, in order for that to be successful here, Canada has to implement that type of scenario if you want to get a license. I guess that's what I'm trying to, in 20 minutes very hard and we can dig in in the panel. But in my opinion, I don't think we at a, uh, a stage yet without that database that I could um, in, in good faith recommend people getting a license right now because if you can't register, the whole thing just doesn't make sense. So they're saying the only way to get protected is to register in that database and then be recognized, you know. So um, that's the reason why we've aggressively invested in the 941 to 960 uh, um, because we feel those news teams or anyone that's moving, um, and it's only about 18 megahertz, but it's better than nothing, won't have time to register necessarily into, I mean, these are mission crit critical type, you know, sort of ENG, EFP, and um, no white space devices are going to be allowed in, in that bandwidth. So again, I've got to stress um, how, how important this will become. Um, but they were very, very, and this was a fight, believe me. Um, in the 953 to 959 um, space, um, I thought we were almost there, and um, Nav Air sent an objection <coughs> in because they had some, um, on Toronto, Toronto uh, Island, there's um, uh, equipment as an aircraft lands, for instance. Um, and it, it's older type technology. Um, and they felt we were too close at 959.85 to there. And, and, and I you know, had to be diplomatic as how can a wireless microphone affect an aircraft coming down? You'd have to be right on the tarmac. <laughs> but sure enough, Industry Canada um, were, were gracious and polite um, to us, but they did have to take that complaint seriously. Um, all we did, um, you talked about guard bands, was um, the compromise, and it wasn't much, was I, I suggested that we go with the same FCC guard band, which was, you know, 150, um, which is nothing, kilohertz. And uh, that was fine for Industry Canada, and they accepted <coughs> it, and they told Nav Air that, um, in fact, Industry Canada were very helpful in, in, in all respects um, in, in that um, in that regard. Um, so I, I know Rob will dig in more about this, as well as Ike, um, but that's the big picture right now and where things are at. Thanks, Colin. Great, thanks very much, Colin, uh, for that overview from ISED, the industry formerly known as Industry Canada. Um, up next, we have uh, Rob Peretti. Rob uh, has been in the industry for 25 years and provided uh, wireless solutions for live events and venues in Canada and around the world. Rob has a, an, uh, was an RX, RF expert for Sennheiser Canada for eight years, providing engineering, design, and specification support uh, for their partners. Rob specializes in designing large, complex RF systems for broadcasters and large, large events 
for requirements for multi-zone combining, facility-wide frequency coordination, and systems integration are the norm. Rob managed the Sennheiser service shop at the Vancouver 2014 <coughs> Winter Olympics, where a team of RF experts provided technical support for IOC uh, host broadcaster partners during, the time, during that time frame. He has also consulted with Industry Canada, also known as ICED, uh, regarding the 700 megahertz uh, digital transition and the upcoming 600 megahertz transition. He has developed uh, various tools to determine Canadian DTV environments, all for major cities as well as most countries around the world. Rob was also on the software development team as an architect for the professional setup, comp setup component of wireless systems managers, uh, manager, sorry, WSM. WSM is Sennheiser's software solution. Uh, to manage uh, wireless devices and frequency coordination. Please uh, join me in welcoming Rob. Uh, good evening. My name is Rob Peretti, and I'll uh, be discussing the current state of the 600 meg repack and how we can prepare for the new environment. And I hope I'll stay in sync between the two systems here. Uh, short outline, first of all. Um, I'll first do a quick review of the uh, 600 megahertz mandate and where we are in the process. Um, I'll review the band plan and uh, talk about why that spectrum is important, similar to what Colin did. Uh, I'll provide some links to um, uh, both the US and Canada websites that track the transition, um, including the database files. And uh, with those files and spectrum scans, I'll also present uh, a post-May 2020 RF environment estimate for the GTA. And then finally, I'll discuss how to mitigate the effects of some of these changes, the compressed spectrum. Um, I'll do that by having a brief technology review, some products, and then, if I have time, an example of how to design a broadcast IAB system that minimizes, or sorry, maximizes the number of carriers possible in a, in a frequency band. So in the fall of 2015, uh, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada announced that a new 600 megahertz band plan would be established in a joint development with the FCC in the US. The mandate was to, quote, maximize the economic and social benefits for Canadians, unquote. Um, the repurposing of the 600 megahertz band starts by repacking TV stations in the lower VHF and UHF space. Once that's complete, the 600 megahertz band will be redeployed for commercial mobile services. I said and FCC created a framework for repurposing that uh, spectrum. There are a lot of moving parts to a spectrum allocation, uh, lots of consultations with uh, a great number of stakeholders, and this all takes time. So where are we? We're currently in between six and seven. Um, this is the, uh, the, the uh, chart th uh, that was released by Industry Canada. Um, the next important phase is 10. That is on May 2nd of 2020. Um, <clears throat> This is when UHF stations uh, within 350 kilometers of the border uh, begin phase testing. Uh, both Toronto and Vancouver in this phase, it takes a few months to go through it. Um, I spoke to a senior ICED staff member and I've been told that the repack television structures below 608 goes into effect on that day. So everything between 470 and 608, obviously transmitters are changing. Um, so all that goes into play at that time. Uh, above um, 608, or I guess more technically above 617, um, I was told that you could continue to use it until the auction winners deploy LTE services. So that's a slight difference than uh, uh, what Colin presented as in, in writing from ICED's uh, website where they basically specified after the auction's over, that's it. Um, and I think 
Industry Canada, one thing I've learned working with them is, um, and you, you'll see the, the text here and there, uh, where you can operate uh, in, with no interference. So as long as you're operating with no interference, you're not going to have a problem. So I think her point of view was you can continue to operate until LTE services are out there because they're not going to bother anybody. Uh, all the TV stations will have been moved uh, further south. So that auction, there's the winners. Uh, that's available on the website. Um, I just have to catch up on my laptop. Uh, there are a total of nine winners, and uh, that is a lot of cheddar. 3.47 billion. Um, I put going on to the broadcaster. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I've put a, a link um, there. That link is um, what the penalties are if you if you continue to broadcast after May second, and LTE um, services have been deployed. Hey, Rob, can I, can I just point something out? You want to go back to that slide for a second? Yeah. Um, Oops, wrong one. Just, just to illustrate the difference between Canada and the U.S. So the U.S. auction wrapped up, and we know that the winners, one of the winners was T-Mobile, and they, mm -hmm. block, they bought <coughs> blocks B and C pretty much all over the U.S.A. Uh, B and C downlink, B and C uplink. Um, what isn't known is who generally bought the rest of it, how much of it is being, um, how much of it's being used, how much of it's being held on to for, you know, an investment or whatever. Um, so that's kind of a difference between Canada and the States. This is the first time I've seen this slide, but what you see here is that every bit of it that was available up here has been sold, and it's been sold to people that are very, very, very probably going to put it into use as soon as they possibly can. Um, technically, there is 104 of 112 possible licenses. You'll, you'll notice in some of the F and G ranges that ICID is listed because that wasn't auctioned, so there are some open slots. Um, and also in Canada, I'm not sure exactly what the deal is, but if you don't use your, spec your spectrum, you can lose it. And there's probably an extensive process for doing that. So I don't think you can just buy the stuff and sit on it in Canada. Could be different in the US. All right, so um, onwards on why this stuff is so valuable. Um, so, uh, Colin alluded to this, wave propagation is the critical item. Uh, technically, it's the last bit of desirable beachfront property um, with UHF available for auction. Um, I sort of make a little bit of a joke on that because until the next one. Um, there's, and, and that's, we'll see what happens in the US in 2022 and whether Canada follows suit. So, uh, so what is it about wave propagation? <coughs> so the higher the frequency of a, of a radio signal, the less distance it can travel, uh, sorry, uh, the less distance it can travel through the air. Um, and conversely, the lower the frequency of a radio signal, the easier it is to penetrate physical things like buildings and trees and even underground parking lots. These are the two main properties that make 600 megahertz desirable and you can put a cost associated to that. Um, th there's literally uh, three times the infrastructure required to deploy 1.9 gig LTE versus 600. Um, and that's a lot of money when you're trying to um, handle a large country like Canada. So let's look at the band plan. This is the current structure. At the far right is the uh, 700 megahertz band that was auctioned in 2012. Uh, the orange area, of course, is reserved for radio astronomy. And uh, below that, of course, is the rest of UHF from channel 14 and 36. 
Here's the 600 megahertz band. You, you saw a version of it in, in Colin's uh, um, presentation. Um, as before, 37 is reserved for radio astronomy and medical telemetry. And at this time, there will not be any white space devices there. And uh, a blowout here for the guard band. Um, first of all, the guard band channel 36 was not in the original ISED uh, documents. It's also not part of the U.S. structure. Uh, however, I've confirmed with senior ISED officials that it indeed, it indeed is part of the Canadian deployment and is considered a guard band. The rest of the organization generally follows the U.S. plan, uh, except for that one megahertz band that uh, Colin discussed earlier. Um, following channel 37 is a, the, a three megahertz band and then the downlink, and that's followed by the duplex gap and the uplink band. The U.S. is uh, further ahead in defining exactly how these spaces are to be used. I said is still finalizing uh, details. I think everyone saw that Colin was a bit frustrated, and I'm sure most manufacturers are as well. It should have been done by now. Um, March of last uh, of this year, I should say, I said issued several updates regarding white space devices, and that can be found there, and. Uh, and also for wireless microphones, and that's that link. Um, so some takeaways uh, based on those uh, documents. Um, wireless mics will be per permitted in the guard band and duplex gap, subject to upcoming technical revision of uh, RS-123. Um, as already mentioned, channel 37 remains off limits. Uh, this might seem obvious, but uh, the 600 megahertz commercial band is also out of bounds. Uh, Low-powered white space devices and licensed wireless mics can operate in the upper six megahertz um, <clears throat> of the, excuse me, <clears throat> duplex gap. <clears throat> That's the problem with these things. You can't get away with them then. <clears throat> Cough. Um, this is, of course, also subject to technical uh, rules from ISED. And, uh, and of course, in the case of white space devices, um, the creation of the entire ecosystem still has to happen. So um, that's a ways away. And then finally, there's still a moratorium on licenses uh, in that spectrum. Um, that, that's it. Rob, could you just mention um, channel 36, you can use wireless mics. Channel 36, yeah, okay, so fair. Uh, when I mean guard band, I mean they will not deploy uh, digital television in that band. So that's available as a white space to, to operate your microphones. Guard to 37. Correct. Correct. What happens in 37? No one knows. <laughs> uh, radio astronomy and <laughs> medical telemetry. <laughs> and the problem with those technologies is they're very low power because okay. they're beaming out into the universe. Okay. So they can't have pollution in that area. So that's why they have guard bands because of the very low power radi uh, radiation that they're sensing. <laughs> well, it, it wraps Are up. we alone? It that wraps one? Up the <laughs> exactly. Out that if they want to talk to us, they have to do it between 608 and 614 <laughs> megahertz. <laughs> otherwise, piss off. Exactly one half It's probably used by one of those three letter acronyms in the U.S., anyways, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, what is white space? I mean, I'm not going to assume that everybody knows what white space is. Uh, and we've already mentioned it a number of times. So um, white space refers to spectrum that's not being used by licensed uh, operators, either at a particular time or in a geographic area, making that spectrum available for other services. Then there's white space devices, and that's something different. And in Canada, it really doesn't exist, as Colin already alluded to. Um, White space devices is still in development. Uh, 
Um, they'll, they're going to be managed and administered via white space database, and ISED is still in the process of developing rules regarding geolocation <clears throat> and registration. And although white space devices will be unlicensed, uh, just like mics, they will require registration. I think it's going to take them so long to get their act together, but by then they're going to have white space sensing devices where you won't have to register it. There's going to be systems, Pico's LTE5 will be out, and it'll just know when a white space device gets turned on. Um, but we'll see how that plays out. That's the database, um, which we don't have. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's going to be like a MAC address or something, but each device will have a registration number, and, and you have to register that device in, in the database. How's the worship of the invention? Are you going to be driving around on Sunday morning with standards or something? Well, don't you know, once <laughs> LTE 5 comes out, there's going to be <clears throat> something everywhere. We'll see. The cell tower is everywhere. The cell tower will report that. All right. Um, um, that's a good question. Um, my understanding is, as what Colin mentioned, there's very sort of confined experiments going on, but I don't think they have an actual white space device system in play yet. And, <clears throat> and uh, the whole database thing is what the US guys are doing as well. The problem with that is there's been a lot of pushback because you know any of the RF guys in, 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 in the room here will know that if you go to the FCC site, I mean, that database has got tons of problems on it, in it. And it's, it's part of the problem of managing a large database like that. There's just a lot of errors. So there's a lot of people that are, there's, there's two approaches that they want to do, the, the, the white spaces. There's the database and the auto sensors. And people are complaining about the fact that databases aren't accurate. And people are complaining about the fact that the sensing systems that there are being yeah. developed are not ready for prime time. And that's one of the reasons why things are slow. Uh, I'm just curious too, would you not be using uh, registrations for spread, sp uh, uh, like frequency hopping spread spectrum. Mm. Don't know about that. There's areas where you can use that technology, um, but I don't know if they register it in such a way. I need to get through this. I've got a lot of stuff to go through, and <laughs> hopefully we'll have a chance either in a round table yeah. or yeah. Um, uh, just on a, on a Q&A at the end. Okay, um, I'm going to go through a bunch of uh, links, both with FC, uh, Industry Canada, or ISET, and, um, and um, the FCC. So this is a good place to start. And it's, it's easy if you just Google ISET and uh, something like a DTV allotment, and you'll get here. And there, a lot of the links come from that page. Um, it includes the online database schedules, et cetera. At the bottom of this page, you'll also find the uh, Annex A, which is the DTV allotment page. It shows each of the current TV stations with its post-transition channel and other parameters. So there you can see that CFTO is changing, or has changed from channel eight to channel nine because VHF transition happened in phase three. So that's already, already been done. Uh, and then on the... Um, all right, so how did we get there? Sorry, I need to catch up. Okay, another good link. This is uh, the transition schedule. Um, one of the issues that Industry Canada had with the 700 meg transition is interference near borders because the US was over a year, maybe two years in advance of Canada. Uh, and there were a lot of issues with that. So that's why in the 600 meg repack, they elected to work together and within the same time frames. It, slightly different time frames, but coordinated between in the border areas, I think is more accurate. Um, in any case, at the bottom of this page, uh, there is something Rob? called... Just uh, flip. Oh, we're there already. Um, at the bottom of this page, uh, there is the actual schedule. Uh, there we go. 
So you can see that the VHS start in phase 10. The next, if you look at C, CJMT there, that's phase 10. So VHF is, is or sorry, uh, VHF is phase three and UHF is phase 10. Um, you can filter the, the list for any city. Um, this is filtered for Toronto. You'll notice there's only five changes in Toronto, but there's many more changes affecting the GTA area because uh, some of these stations are in Hamilton or in Peterborough and Guelph, et cetera. It depends on where the transmitting tower is. So you really have to sort of uh, do some searches for that. Um, okay, so I think we can move on. And now on the FCC site, the, the page to look at uh, is wireless uh, microphones because from there you can have access to all the other links. Um, all the U.S. phases are listed with completion uh, in July uh, 3rd, 2020. There's the transition schedule. Um, and then finally, uh, this is a very interesting link because it provides Word, PDF, and CSV files for all the television station data across the U.S. And uh, it's a little bit better than the industry, uh, the ISED files because they will actually tell you what the new ERP is. Um, with each of the, uh, uh, you can imagine if we're moving uh, towers from different frequencies, then they have to compensate for the wave propagation losses and gains depending on where they're going to. So the power changes are all listed there. Okay, so I mentioned that um, I created a, a May 2020 uh, estimate of the GTA area. I use a spreadsheet to uh, um, manage frequency plans for large RF projects. And this chart shows all wireless related spectrum from VHF to EHF. Uh, although for this presentation, I've stopped everything above Bluetooth. Um, the chart shows an estimated RF environment in 2020 by using the Industry Canada database and the FCC files from the last slides. Big black squares are strong signals, small black squares are weaker ones and I've cross-referenced the database info with actual spectrum scans, which I'll show later. Uh, please note this is worst case scenario. I put all the channels for the entire GTA in, the, in this, uh, from Halton region to Durham region. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, quite a few changes. I've marked in red the Canadian channels that have changed, and the US channels are in blue. Stations with black call letters are not changed post repack. Uh, ERPs are changing for any repack station. Uh, my calculations, as I mentioned, are only for uh, handling wave propagation. I've listed them on the side there, if you can see it. Um, a closer look at just the UHF portion. So the GTA uh, composite is, is essentially taking the worst case scenario in each of the uh, other four areas that I've, I've done. So if you run an ENG group, that's something that you might want to uh, look at depending on where they're operating. And then um, the UHF uh, spectrum scan, I did an exterior scan at the uh, Rogers Center, um, high sensitivity, and I stitched each of the DTV channels that I scanned in their current locations in what will be the 2020 locations. Um, take note that um, the blue line is actually minus 110. Oops, I meant to go that way. So um, it's, quite, it's going to be quite congested. So how do we deal with this? Um, how do we mitigate this lack of spectrum? The first thing I would do is move uh, all intercom to non-TV UHF space. Um, it, there's a combination of reasons why I'm saying that. The first is just that there's a lot of options in that regard. Most of the manufacturers have gone that way. And uh, if you're just out of the space, then you've got more room for IFBs and mics and uh, in your monitoring systems. Um, intercom that are based on FM, UHF, like the old telex systems, they just uh, are spectrum hogs. They, they take up uh, both RX and TX spectrum, and uh, in 2020, it's just going to be a lot more difficult to coordinate uh, a large number of those devices. 
Uh, today, with the new technology, um, audio fidelity and latency are less critical for most intercom users. And frankly, with the new codecs, they actually sound better than, than any of the old analog stuff. Um, secondly, I would try to switch to uh, digital or hybrid digital technologies. And uh, I added for this, uh, or well-isolated analog. So um, initially, when I got into this, I thought that really the only way to go was uh, digital, because everybody was advertising equidistant carrier spacings. You don't have to calculate IM. Um, but there are some companies on investigation that uh, have very well-isolated devices that can operate with two, 200 kilohertz uh, equidistant spacings and are very robust when it comes to interference. So I'm backing off the digital only approach, but you gotta really make sure you know what you're, what you're looking at. So yeah, spectrally efficient and uh, robust, uh, typically more agile. Uh, they're wideband devices. They often have uh, you know, intelligent things like uh, uh, tracking filters. Um, distributable in terms of uh, things like Dante or, or uh, uh, control systems. Um, often they have back channels so that you can um, control your uh, receiver and transmitters together. And then um, lastly, you need to protect yourself because one of the, one of the sort of uh, off, offshoots of squeezing the spectrum is all the spectrum users are also being squeezed together. So your colleagues, your neighbors, uh, they're all gonna be in the same position. So you're gonna have a bigger chance of having interference from one of those neighbors. Um, and one of the easy ways to, uh, to protect yourself is to filter out of band spectrum where you're not operating. It's gonna also improve your noise floor um, so there's some advantages of doing that. Okay, so I'm um, gonna just, how much time do I, do I have? Mm, that's Pardon? Ten, another 10 or so if you want. Okay, yeah. I think I'm good then. Um, okay, so I'm gonna first talk about um, intercom. Uh, most intercom uh, manufacturers have moved to uh, uh, non-UHF tech. Uh, DECT is quite prevalent but there's also 2.4, 5 gig, and uh, also 900 megahertz ISM. Uh, they're all digital formats. Um, typically, they operate in non-licensed space, usually available globally, which is good for the rental companies or if you're touring or something. Uh, latest tech is very robust, and the audio quality is excellent, certainly much older than any of the old Telex BTRs. Um, creating um, distribution systems are a lot easier because they don't involve active combining systems. Um, one of the main complaints is latency, uh, but once again, with uh, improvements in codecs, that's really become uh, less of an issue. Um, and even though channel spacing, uh, channel limitations, uh, I've got an asterisk on that one because uh, frankly, some of the newer systems offer much larger intercom, wireless intercom systems than the, uh, than the old school stuff. Um, and then finally, wave propagation it can be a, uh, an issue if you're running uh, COM at 600 meg versus 900 meg versus 1.9 gig versus 5 gig. That's going to have an effect. The flip side of that is a lot of these new systems use IP DAS, so distributed antenna systems that are IP based. So it's a lot easier to deploy a mesh network of some kind, a cellular network of some kind to, to widen your coverage without dealing with, uh, you know, once again, cop copper and, and power loss and, and all those complicated things that you've got to do. Okay, moving on to mics and IFBs. Uh, all major manufacturers have second and third digital technologies. I feel like a goof for not putting Q5X up there, sorry. My bad. <laughs> Um, and, and, um, and, and, and I'll restate again that, uh, that you can use analog systems and, and uh, that perform as well or even better than digital systems in terms of um, uh, no IM calculations required, that kind of thing. 
and very narrow uh, carrier spacings. Um, all of them run the entire 470 to 608 range. Uh, latest uh, products are also offered in ISM and 5 gig is coming. Um, there'll be some uh, uh, special band option to cover the duplex and guard bands once I said gets their act together and determine power levels and all the other guidelines for that. Um, and then on legacy devices, band limiting will be possible by, uh, uh, most manufacturers are allowing you to reprogram devices where part of the operating range span the illegal and the illegal, uh, legal and illegal ranges. So you'll be able to, uh, through firmware, update it so that it only operates in the legal space so you don't get yourself in trouble. Okay, I'm just syncing. Okay, ISM based intercom, uh, Clearcom FreeSpeak, everybody knows uh, 2.4, but they also operate uh, in DECT. Uh, Appliant Technologies CrewCom, another dual band system, 900 meg and 2.4 gig. And then uh, Leon is actually the only one that I could find that had a 5 gig uh, frequency operating range. Uh, and then DECT based uh, in North America, that's the range. Uh, Riedel Bolero is, uh, is one, FreeSpeak 2, of course, and RTS Romeo. Analog hybrid, radioactive designs. Um, so radioactive designs is, is quite interesting because um, they expressly designed their system to combat uh, the shrinking UHF spectrum space. So RAD operates their base station to transmit in UHF, but their belt packs transmit in VHF. And then they use AM uh, modulation um, that is li literally 10 times more efficient than FM. Uh, so you can get a lot of channels in, in little space with the RAD system. But as I point out, you've got a lot of options with other technologies that are not in UHF. And I didn't, I'm not sure if you saw the VHF, but VHS is getting crowded as well. So <coughs> something to consider in, in the whole piece of the puzzle. Uh, digital mics in uh, IEM, and I need to catch up here. Um, okay, so on, on digital mics, I put an asterisk on there for the same reason. Um, there are analog mics that will do the work. If you're going to buy something new, though, you really need to consider what digital gives, gives to you. There's no companders. It, they sound great. There's some nice tech in it, etc. cetera. Um, but those are examples of... Um, you know, the latest in, in uh, digital technology, and at the last item there is an analog device. Uh, of interest is the Alteros uh, UW uh, ultra wide bandwidth device. Um, that's, that's pretty high tech stuff. It uses uh, a 6 gig, 500 meg wide carrier to uh, do 24 channels of microphones. I don't know if, if you're going to speak more about that, but... Uh, I'm going to mention it, but it's, it's not technically a carrier, really. It's, <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's, it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's like a Gaussian noise floor, but it's still an RF. It's still radio frequencies. It's still... But the duty cycle is on like two nanoseconds, so it's almost off all the time. So you don't have to coordinate with something that's not even on and is so low that nothing actually sees it. Um, it's very interesting technology, and it sounds great. Okay, um, and then finally, um, IAM and IFBs, um, Electrosonic M2 Duet um, is a, a, a true digital system, and MyPro from China has a digital IF, IAM system. Go figure. All right, um, if I've got five minutes left, I'm going to try to whip through... Uh, the question of why do we want devices that do not require intermod calculations? So the reason is that we can place many more carriers in the same amount of spectrum space. So I have two or three slides that will um, sort of illustrate the impact of this. But we need a fundamentals of intermod. So first of all, what is intermodulation? So when you have two signals that are summed in a circuit and it's operating in a nonlinear fashion, it will create additional signals at multiples of those frequencies. And they, what they do is they create some indifferences of the combined systems, the signals, and these are called intermod products or harmonics. 
So if we have two frequencies, F1 and F2, the second order products are multiples at those frequencies plus some indifference of those frequencies. Third order in a similar fashion, and fourth order, fifth order, etc. So as an example, if we have two transmitters operating, let's say at 479 and 480 megahertz, significant, and I say significant because they're nearby as opposed to out of band, uh, IM3 products will be 478 and 481. And fifth order products will be 477 and 482. So that's with two carriers. Let's add a third frequency. Okay, so now all those white dot, and notice that they're directly above F1, F2, and F3. So you just created interference for all three transmitters. So you can see that you can't simply add equidistant spacing unless you can isolate the device enough so that you don't care about intermod. But older tech all operates this way. So now let's try to create 24 carriers in 18 megahertz or three UHF channels. So the parameters I'm using for this is a carrier spacing of 350 kilohertz because I want to do stereo. Uh, 25 kilohertz search step, 2TX IM3, 250, and 3TX IM350, and I'm not even going to look at IM5. <clears throat> I should make a note that this is the standard settings for a PCM, uh, sorry, PSM 1000 sure on Workbench. The max I could get on three different pieces of software is 16 carriers. And by the way, take note of all those little white lines. So uh, design strategy is to filter. If you filter your systems, you have some advantages. Of course, you can lower the noise floor, which is good because um, it, can, it can allow your links to have a better carrier to signal noise, which becomes important in your, uh, your uh, edge coverage area. As you get further away, the difference between the noise floor and your carrier signal becomes small. Uh, so if you can lower that noise floor a bit, you can eke out some additional distance. You can isolate spectrum to minimize IM products, and that's what we're trying to do in this particular example. So the strategy here will be to split the 18 megahertz into three 6 megahertz range and filter each region. And then I can coordinate each of those eight carrier regions separately. So example, I've coordinated it, uh, eight carriers for one TV channel, six megahertz, and that's all the intermod created for those uh, eight carriers. But if I filter it, then I don't have to worry about intermod outside of that area. So I'm just going to, I know I'm running out of time here, so I want to run quickly through here. So this is uh, sort of the uh, diagram where I have uh, essentially a bunch of uh, 24 channels of PSMs going to a combining system and then going to filters and then to three separate antennas. That's what it looks like. And then this is the uh, cavity filters used for each of the uh, three TV stations and the workbench calculation. 24 carriers inside of 18 megahertz using safe parameters. And that's it. Great, thanks Rob, appreciate it. That was uh, fabulous. Um, so just a little anecdote, uh, one of my favorite conversations with a person from ISED uh, at Wabi was um, uh, earlier this year, uh, or earlier this year, 
was uh, he publicly stated that uh, if you ask me directly, I'll give you one answer. What's on our website is something different. <laughs> um, so I said, uh, answers from I said are very uh, fluid. Yeah, fluid. <laughs> uh, next up, Ike Zimbel. Uh, Ike is a freelance RF frequency coordinator and technician who has worked on major broadcasts and sports events as well as uh, touring with the likes of Shania Twain and Taylor Swift. A firm believer in the practical approach, Ike, Ike has been a speaker and a trainer at numerous AES functions and has to date had eight articles on RF matters published. Ike is a Canadian manufacturer's rep for, innovative, for the innovative uh, radioactive designs RF intercom system and an application engineer for groundbreaking Alteros microphone, wireless microphone systems, which uh, you've heard Rob talk about a little bit. Uh, Ike's talk will focus tonight on the practical and applied uh, aspects of getting multiple wireless systems to work in the reduced spectrum available after the 600 uh, megahertz transition. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ike. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, you know, there's been a lot of tension and everything and drama about this whole repack, so I just want everybody to kind of take a big, deep breath, and then let's just move on to actually making our stations work and uh, doing our broadcasts and that kind of thing, and, and uh, let's just figure out how to work with what we have. Uh, I'm batting clean up here. Uh, Colin and Rob have covered pretty much everything that I have here, but I'm just going to just share a few things with you as we go by. So, how to make the most of the remaining spectrum. There's these five key points, which is actually six. Um, <laughs> band planning, frequency coordination, filtering, zoning, which hasn't really been covered, power management, which hasn't quite been addressed, and alternative spectrum devices, which have been. So, moving on. Band planning. It's the same as it was before the 600 megahertz repack. You have to figure out where you want to put your transmit devices, as in fixed transmits like IFBs and that kind of thing, and where you want to put your source devices like wireless microphones and that kind of thing. And the only thing that's different is that now we have to put them in, in a smaller space than we had to put them in before. So for example, I'm doing some work with Riza at the um, uh, chorus down here, and the original installation down there was very, very cut and dried. It said, all the microphones are above 600 megahertz, and all the IFBs are below 600 megahertz. And the intercom, so the intercom receives were above 600, and the intercom transmits were below 600, were below 600 and it was just, easily separated along those lines. Um, this uh, trace here that you see is uh, from the Hugh Jackman tour that I just uh, finished up a little while ago. And the band plan there is that at the upper and end or lo lower ends of the spectrum, or vice versa depending where you're looking at, so at the lower end here and the upper end here, were my in-ear transmits. I had Sure G10s and J8s. And in the middle part there is all of the microphones. This wasn't a huge coordination by any stretch. It was about 40 transmits on, on, a, on a really busy day. So there's lots of room in there. But you can see that's the spectrum between 470 and I think 610 or something like that. And uh, so my band plan was quite simple, is to put the in-ears at either end and put the microphones in between. Now, as well as planning it that way, that was also using uh, a device called the WYSICOM uh, BFA, which is a filter amplifier, inline filter amplifier device that they make, which is a lovely device. And it has a bunch of different filter presets in it, but it also has one called narrowband, which is a 40 megahertz window. And you can tune it over any 40 megahertz from uh, 470 to uh, 510 to right up to, uh, you know, just below 608 or whatever. So the uh, microphone transmits in the middle are in this little 40 megahertz window and everything on either side of it's filtered. 
So it just made for very clean microphone stuff. Now, as you can see, there's a DTV channel or two in the middle of that window. And um, it doesn't have the granularity of what Rob was talking about with the cavity filters, where you can actually dial in like one DTV channel and say, I'm putting my mics in there. But for general use, it's quite handy. Um, frequency coordination. It's more critical than ever before. Um, the, one of the things about digital devices with equal spacing and doing away with um, the need for frequency coordination or the need to think about intermods and all that stuff is if you're going to do that, you have to do it with every single device that you have. Because if you can't do that, then you can't guarantee that an intermod that's created by these devices is not going to land somewhere in this equal spacing where you're putting your digital devices. And the other thing about intermods is that they can occur, can and do occur in two places. They can occur in combined transmits. So if you have, for example, eight in-ear monitors or eight IFBs and they're going through a frequency combiner, which is a good case, or in the case of what happens mostly uh, oftentimes in the broadcast industry where somebody makes a nice little neat pile of eight of the IFB T4s is, and you've got eight antennas there, what that antenna, those eight antennas are in close proximity to each other is the greatest intermod farm that you have ever seen. Um, and, and it can be two devices. I remember James Stoffo telling me about a, a Super Bowl a few years ago, they were tracking down a rogue frequency, and they finally traced it to a window ledge up in the you know, tower on one side of the field. And what it was, was two IFB T4s placed side by side, and the rogue frequency was the intermod that was created by the two of them. Now, if you do an event with people that know what they're doing, um, you will actually see things like IFB T4s, which is pretty much the industry standard IFB system, you will see them taped. There's one taped to a wall up there, and there's another one taped to a wall there, and there's one on the window ledge, and there's one by the back door and everything. And they, when they have not combined antennas, people who know what they're doing will go to a lot of trouble to physically separate them, because otherwise they will create a lot of intermod. But even if they're going through an antenna combiner, which has circuitry in it to limit the amount of intermod that it creates, it will still be created there. And it will come out of the antenna that you're using to transmit. The other place that intermods can and will be generated is in the input of receivers. And basically, if you overdrive the input of a receiver, it's like a fuzz box on a guitar. It just creates all these other harmonics. And those are intermods. So if you have a couple of transmits that are fine by themselves and doing what they're supposed to be, but they're maybe a little close to a receive antenna, and maybe it's a, a receive antenna that's got gain built into it that people either mistakenly left the gain turned up or turned, in, turned it up in the uh, idea that if it's got more gain, I'll get more signal. And that will sit there and just create intermods. And so therefore, you can. Even, for example, in a digital system where you've got equal spacing, if you're using an antenna or two antennas with too much gain on it and you overdrive the front end of those antennas, you will get the intermod in your devices. And even though it happens over the air, it still follows the calculations that these programs like IAS, which is the graph here from, this is a, a graph from a show I did in Atlanta uh, last year. Um, it will still follow those predictions. It will still occur on the predicted frequencies. So that's one of the reasons why frequency coordination is still important and probably isn't going to go away at the very least until the last analog transmitter is turned off. Um, so it's still something that you need to uh, keep in mind. Um, it's the key to getting a lot of frequencies to play well together. Um, I do coordinations fairly regularly that are up into the two and 300 frequencies. And when you've got a venue or a facility 
It's the best way to manage frequency allocation on an ongoing basis. Because a lot of people have this idea that wireless is just this crazy mess that you know, is just an accident waiting to happen or something waiting to bite you in the ass or whatever. And first of all, that's never been my experience, but I have always used frequency coordination as long as I've been involved with wireless. And secondly, what I find is that when you have everything coordinated and every frequency is a wanted frequency, as I say, then what happens is when something does pop up, some reporter wanders in or, you know, news crew wanders in and they come through a side door instead of the media check-in or something like that, is that it's very easy to figure out, first of all, that it's not one of your frequencies and secondly, where it is. So, you know, that's another reason for uh, continuing to use frequency coordination and frequency coordinators like myself. Um, moving on. Filtering. So, as Rob touched on this, it's the best method to ensure that your receive system is seeing the signals that you want it to see and diminishing the levels of the unwanted signals. Now, there's a lot of filters out there. And again, unless you're getting into the six megahertz cavity filters that Rob was talking about, the, the bad news is that these are not your 24 dB or 48 dB per octave crossover filters that we now enjoy using with audio equipment. They're, they're a lot gentler than that. They might be 6 dB per octave or something like that. So um, even with that example, um, just, just a week ago I was in, in New York at the Barclays Center and we were using that 40 megahertz window on the WYSIWYGON filters and we had a few frequencies that were like just a little bit outside of it and they were absolutely fine. So those filters are not a magic bullet but they're just sort of general good housekeeping to for example in the, in the example that I showed you a couple of slides back they will definitely attenuate the level of the transmits that are further away than, than where your, uh, like your in-ear transmits and stuff. Um, unwanted signals are DTV, land mobile radio, which is walkie-talkies, which is uh, police, fire, ambulance, um, the grounds crew, um, the Dwight Crane people, just anybody that's got to communicate on, on a site. Um, cellular, uh, and it just depends on where your receive system is situated in the spectrum. An example that I give, uh, a lot of the coordinations that I do include walkie-talkie frequencies, mostly as a way of making sure that when mobile truck A shows up and, and people start setting up, that their uh, walkie-talkie channel is not on top of one of the ones from the venue or anything. It's mostly a housekeeping thing, but one thing I can tell you, if you uh, really like hanging out in channel 14 uh, in 470, 476 with, uh, you know, Sure G1s or any of these new systems that'll tune from 470 to, to 608 or whatever, is that um, 469.975 is a walkie-talkie frequency. So, you, you know, before you start programming at 470.00 or whatever with your, with your microphones or whatever, just keep in mind that you could be very close to anything that's like a one to two to five watt transmit. And so I always advise just be cautious in the lowest channel that you have available and the highest channel that you have available to just, you know, be a little paranoid up there. Um, there's off-the-shelf filters available from professional wireless systems, uh, who I also represent up here, Electrosonics, RF Venue, WYSICOM, I, I think Sure and Sennheiser also have them, I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, more advanced filters are available, again, from WYSICOM, from Mini Circuits, uh, and there's two or three other companies that name, whose name escaped me right now that produce wireless uh, hardware, uh, mini circuits is, is the one that comes to mind. But that's the kind of place that those uh, cavity filters come from. Zoning. So one of the things that's a trend now is that it's not just two antennas anymore, your A and B. 
Um, at, at the very least, even on an arena show, it's pretty common to have um, an A and B antenna for the stage and an A and B antenna for backstage. Um, if you have a green room, if you have uh, a, another studio, a studio down the hall, whatever, these all start to turn into different antenna zones. And um, with separate antenna zones, you also have the ability to set up, you, you have two abilities. You can either have the ability to have somebody strap on a, a microphone pack and walk anywhere in your venue and you can pick them up, which is great. Or it can also give you the ability to identify these as separate zones, say that you know, that studio down the hall is that cooking show and it's going to be that cooking show for 20 years and nobody from that cooking show is ever going to be, you know, walking past their green room or whatever. And I'm going to call that a separate zone and I'm going to coordinate that separately. And then you get into situations where you can, uh, I would never recommend, for example, reusing the same frequency at two places in the same venue but you might only be 150 kilohertz off or something like that. And as long as it's far enough down the hall and attenuated, it's not going to be a problem. So one of the ways of increasing the amount of frequencies that you have available is identifying what your needs are in your facility. And in, instead of going for this, I want everything to work everywhere, if 99% of the time the things are actually going to work in the studio that they've been allocated to, then maybe you're good that way and, and you can use that as an advantage in terms of allocating more frequencies and less spectrum. Um, and there's a wide range of zoning devices available uh, from professional wireless systems. They have like two lines. WYSICOM has a device called the MAT-288 which is, has become sort of my main axe on a, a lot of these larger jobs that I do. Um, RF Venue makes a little one that I haven't used yet, but it's just another, it's another arrow in your quiver of, think of figuring out how and where to use wireless. Power management. This is a big one. Um, and the thing is, is the question is, is how much RF power do you really need? <laughs> and the answer is, the least amount is the best amount. All of those um, slides that Rob was showing you with Intermod on it, if you increase the power, you increase the amplitude of all of those Intermod products. And um, very often unnecessarily. Um, <coughs> once again, I mentioned the IFB T4 because it is the industry standard IFB. It comes out of the box at 250 milliwatts and people are used to using it at 250 milliwatts. But, again, if you're in a facility like, for example, the, the 10th floor of the CBC building or whatever, is do you actually need the IFBs to be going around the building at a quarter of a watt, um, you know, so somebody can, you know, go to the, to the cafeteria on the first floor and, and hear that they're missing their cue? Do you really need that? If you don't need that, um, there are options. Uh, inside that unit that you can lower the output to 100 milliwatts or 50 milliwatts. If they're going through any kind of combiner, I highly recommend that you, that you lower them to 50 milliwatts because if you cook, hook them up to a combiner at 250 milliwatts, they're basically just going to uh, shorten the life expectancy of that device. But again, people have become so used to this idea that, you know, I've got power here and I'm going to use it to get through walls and all this other stuff is if you don't need it, don't use it. Um, at this show at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, uh, I did um, about two weeks ago, it's a little bit of a blur now, but uh, we were using the Sure Axion digital stuff and every transmitter was set on 10 milliwatts and it was just fine. Um, and also, just a, a little side thing about talking about propagation. Um, one of the reasons that we're losing this spectrum is the propagation is really great. And one of, one of the uh, hallmarks of the standards of wireless, um, one of the uh, go-tos is that 
um, line of sight is, is the golden standard for you know, setting up transmitters and receivers. Is make sure that your antenna is in line of sight between transmitter and receiver. And that's absolutely true. But what is absolutely equally confounding is how often the RF just goes to places that you could not even imagine. On, on the Taylor Swift tour uh, one night, I really had to pee during the show. I got my assistant to mind, this, mind the store, and I went down off the back of the stage and up a VOM. We're in a stadium. I go up a VOM. I turn right. I go over about that far. I walk down a concrete hallway and into a concrete bunker that's a men's room. And I'm wearing an inner pack with her mix in it. And I'm standing there fumbling with my zipper, and it's perfect. How is that line of sight? The antennas are 100 feet away on the stage, facing out into the stadium. I'm 100 feet behind them, behind brick wall, concrete, down a hall, down a tunnel, all this stuff, and it still works. So line of sight is great. You always plan for line of sight. Um, I've seen people that do installations and things like this really make this mistake of just putting the metal equipment rack in the back room with the wireless, with the antennas inside the metal rack. And the sad thing is, is that kind of sort of works because the RF does go through some stuff and it kind of goes everywhere, but that's not, that's not correct practice. But the point is, is that when you're trying to sort of visualize where it's going, is that you have to realize that it often goes to places that you would never imagine it could or never intended it to go to. Um, but again, at, at this uh, same thing, at this uh, event at the Barclay Center, which was a big fashion show, the account manager said, well, you know, I want, I want you guys to put extra uh, antennas for the in-ears back in the hallways where the dressing rooms are in case, you know, any of the artists are walking around back there. And I said, well, let's, let's just wait, because I don't like putting up particularly transmits. You don't want more transmit antennas than you need because the RF goes everywhere, and they get all up in each other's business, and then you get fan cancellations and dropouts and everything. So we said, let's, let's do the two antennas for the main zone, and then we'll walk test it. And walk test it in the hallways, once again, the back of the antenna is over there, and then there's one of those collapsed seating things that's got like 12 rows of seats all crushed to this, and then a brick wall or whatever, and then you're in a brick corridor, and it's just fine. And you go back into one of the dressing rooms off of that corridor on the other side, and it's just fine. So the point is, is a lot of it can get to a lot of different places without even being on like really high power. So, the less power you use, the more likely that you are be going to be able to get a greater number of transmits in less spectrum. Um, and another thing to check out is a lot of these newer systems have a, a high density mode, which means low transmit power, which we're talking about one milliwatt, and uh, can, where it can work reliably. The uh, David Byrne tour, I forget what it was called, but the one that he just wrapped up, um, I was in early discussions to, about that. I didn't end up doing it, but I read uh, an article about it afterwards. And they actually used the Shure ULXD. Part of the deal with the tour was everything was wireless. Everything was wireless because it was a bare stage with just to make things really interesting with an aluminum chain mail curtain on uh, three sides of it. Um, and uh, but every single instrument, that, there were no set pieces of instruments, things came on, get, went off, whatever. all had to be wireless, all in-ears, all that stuff. And uh, they actually used the, the one milliwatt high density mode of the Shure ULXD stuff doing outdoor shows, and it worked fine. So again, the least amount of power that you can get away with is the best amount. Alternative spectrum devices. Um, Alternative to what? Again, Rob and Colin both covered this. We're just talking about the UHF right now, 470 to 698. Um, some, everything that's old is new again. Comtech IFBs have like never gone away, basically. And um, 
They are a little difficult but compared to more modern stuff. It is difficult to get a lot of them to work in a small amount of spectrum. But um, definitely something you can keep in mind if you have to put IFBs somewhere uh, is to use the, there's the ones in the low band, low band VHF and then there's the ones that are 216. Um, Electrosonic now makes the IFB T4 in a VHF version, 50 milliwatts. Um, the RAD intercom, as, as uh, Rob was good enough to mention, all of the belt pack transmits are in the v, upper VHF range. Uh, the occupied bandwidth is, um, it's about 25 kilohertz, we say 30 kilohertz, just, just to have a little bit of room around it, but uh, you can get um, well over 90 in one six megahertz uh, TV channel. Um, so uh, there's 900 and 1300 megahertz, which is technically sort of still UHF. Uh, WYSICOM makes uh, a system that actually goes up to 1300 megahertz. Um, sure, X55 band is in the 900 megahertz range. Again, most of that stuff you need some kind of license or something to use, so you got to be careful about that. Um, you know, don't buy it for your church kind of thing. Uh, the deck band, uh, we've basically covered all this stuff. Alteros, I'll just mention that quickly, is uh, a very unique system uh, among other unique properties is it's the only digital system that actually clocks the, uh, the A to D right at the transmitter. So um, it means that the system is, is clocked right from basically as soon as the microphone turns into digital at the pack, that's where the clocking happens. And um, it's 24 channels in a three rack space. Um, CP or MCU we call it, and uh, you just have to put up a lot of these uh, bi-directional antennas that we use to get good coverage, but when you do, it's very solid. Again, it sounds great. No compounding. Uh, it spits out Dante, AES, and optical, I believe, all at the same time. You can use all three together. And there's a bunch of other stuff. That's a whole separate meeting, basically. Um, one thing I wanted to point out about the, the RAD intercom system is it's getting to the point where it is going to be the only system that has a real-time round-trip uh, side tone to it, which means that if you are in situations where it's absolutely critical that, that you know that when you say uh, it's okay to unleash the tiger or whatever, that... Um, <laughs> You, you know, you're not just talking to yourself because with all of the all of the other IP-based intercom systems, um, the side tone is generated locally at the pack because of latency, and um, so you basically you talk into the microphone, it comes out in your ear, and it's doing that through the pack, but it's not doing that through the system. So uh, I did a, a a really great walk test at Nathan Phillips Square one time with a 900 megahertz Tempest system. Best walk test I ever did in my life. And when I got about two blocks away, I went, I need to call somebody and see if this is round trip or whether it's local side tone. Because basically, I was walking around talking to myself the whole time. Um, so the one thing, again, uh, RAD is the only one that's going to offer that round trip uh, confidence monitoring of knowing if you heard yourself, then anyone else that's on the intercom system heard it as well. Uh, and what else do we got here? Strategies to consider. Co-channeling IFBs is two audio channels per one transmit frequency. Um, requires a stereo transmitter, like an, like an in-ear system as opposed to an IFB, which is typically a mono system. Um, but they have to have very good separation between left and right. The Electrosonics Duet is a very good example of that. Uh, the new Shure P10R Plus, which is a, a, a very serious redesign of, of, the, of the Shure PSM1000 in-ear pack, uh, also meets that criteria. They uh, basically redesigned the whole front-end audio and radio in that pack. 
Uh, and the, we demoed some of them on the Taylor tour last year, and the difference in separation was so stunning that we, uh, the crew, decided that you literally could not put one on an artist as a replacement pack <coughs> because it literally changed the mix. Things like uh, drum, uh, drum fills that were panned seemingly in, in a stock PSM 1000 pack from about here to here were like literally shoulder to shoulder uh, with the new pack. So, uh, and the WYSIWYGCOM 950 also has that kind of separation. So with that kind of separation, you can put IFB1 down the left channel of, of this pack and IFB2 down the right channel and have very good confidence that they're not gonna uh, cross talk with each other or anything like that. And then instead of having two high powered transmits, you're using one. So you can literally double your density on IFBs and that kind of thing by using that stuff. Um, just, I feel worse than Rob for not mentioning Q5X. I just, I just want to put that in there. Um, and uh, again, that approach is not recommended for older analog systems. And it's not recommended, for example, if you go to your house of worship and say, well, we're going to have six in-ear mixes instead, six mono mixes instead of three stereo mixes. It's probably not going to work that well. So um, don't do that. And the other thing is, you know, everybody... Everybody, oh yeah, I get this all the time when I'm coordinating events. You know, God, can you give me something that's a little further apart from this or that? It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't live or die by separation. I've, I will put things 300 kilohertz away from each other and it's fine if you know what you're doing, how you're doing it, and various other things. So, uh, and for example, like the, the, uh, the Shure, systems will tune to 300 kilohertz separation and I've used them like that all the time and you know one of the benefits of it is like when I'm looking at frequencies with my TTI spectrum analyzer with a one megahertz window I can look at two frequencies um, you know on, on the Taylor tour that happened to be your stage piano so I like putting things close together so get used to, being, to doing that kind of thing. If you're looking for the kind of wide open spaces that we used to have, it's, that's kind of a thing in the past. Uh, so I was going to skip the Q&A because we're going to do the round table, the, uh, sorry, the oblong table discussion. Uh, and that's it. That's great. Thanks. Uh, um, are there any questions? Uh, I have a question about um, white spaces. You know, about 12 years ago, I guess, yeah. uh, IEEE 802.22 was established okay. to do uh, wireless uh, regional area network using cognizant software to find radio. Hello. Check, Has check. Has it way anywhere into the, the wireless mic industry? Well, um, what they've been saying, can, can, you know that low end that you wanted to make everybody sound rich? Can you take it out? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm never going to sound rich, but um, as we've been saying, as far as we know, there haven't been a lot of white spaces showing up in the wild so far. I've heard of some sort of isolated things like in Seattle or somewhere like Microsoft Headquartersville, there is some sort of low power white space thing in the downtown core or something like that. I have not encountered anything uh, in touring in the U.S. in the last couple of years. I have not run into anything like that yet. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. Um, just And another thing about uh, white space devices, as Henry Cohen points out, um, this is going to be your white space device because um, right now this has maybe five radios in it. It's got a Bluetooth radio. It's got a 2.4 gig radio. It's got a 5 gig radio in it. It's FM. got what's that? FM radio. Yeah, but, yeah. I guess it does. Yeah, but if I it's don't a think Samsung. It's got yeah. FM. This yeah. Anyway, so it's got a <coughs> bunch of radios in it, and when they put something that operates in the the 600 megahertz band or the TV band. Um, if they can fit that into this and not have it, you know, light on fire like Samsung likes to do, then um, 
then that's what a white space device will be. And, and you know, hopefully we'll never get to the situation where somebody goes, oh man, I'm at my favorite concert, all oh, the voice just cut out. I don't know what happened, you know, because they're they're streaming, you know, they're streaming the concert on their phone and it just stepped on the singer's microphone. Hopefully we'll, we'll never get to that point. But anyway. Well, I mean, the awesome, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Check, check. Yeah. Yeah. Don't oh. cup the mic. Yeah, <laughs> the awesome white space devices used by Microsoft actually in Kenya, in South Africa, and certainly, uh, so certainly in Africa they are deploying them um, in rural areas where it's been difficult to deploy um, UHF or, you know, et cetera. So it, it's sort of point to point, and very interesting. So I guess Microsoft invested in, in, from schools, you know, sending information from a certain school to another school or for a university to a, a, another school, et cetera or possibly for essential medical type communication in rural areas again, but certainly not in our space right now, so. Yeah, I, I think I would just echo what they said and, and the fact that um, actually most of the IT companies that were at all the stakeholder meetings, like Microsoft and Apple, et cetera, there, you know, there's motivation there to, uh, to have access to that space and um, for white space devices, but I mean, white spaces devices are personal, portable devices. So, you know, from our standpoint, being in broadcast, touring, mm -hmm. et cetera, we're not necessarily at the leading edge of that, but right now there isn't a commercial outlet for white space devices in Canada and the U.S. It's early, as I mentioned, it's early days, yeah. so un until that commercial outlet is available, then, then we'll see what happens. Then manufacturers will start developing, right? I just got to add, I feel worse than Rob and I could. I didn't mention <laughs> Q5A. Hey, so. it's not a contest, Colin. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> um, yeah, next question. Yes, Anthony. So the 940 band is very appealing to media outlets and people who do ENG shoots and film bag guys, et cetera, et cetera. What's a license cost? For, um, depends on which spectrum, uh, we, we, we waiting to see what the license cost will be for that 941 to 960. They haven't released it? Well, it's not certified yet, so once the certification is, which is soon, with, uh, probably six to eight weeks away, um, we're certainly going to be applying for that license. So we're hoping they keep it. Uh, has anybody applied for a license in Canada? It's, it's no, I, I have a Part 74 license in the States, okay. which costs, uh, uh, it's, it's easier to hire a company like Professional Wireless to, to do the application than wade through the 74 pages or whatever it is on an archaic website. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, that's like 500 bucks. Do you think there's going to be a business of license brokering for uh, companies that are touring that require Uh, I don't see ISID allowing that. No? No. They would allow brokering? No, I mean, that CPC document is, I'd have to study that. But, yeah. but basically, any time I've asked ISID about licenses, um, in particular, if you ask Ottawa, they refer you to your regional office. So wherever you reside in Canada, you have to apply at that Toronto office if you live in Toronto. So there is, um, in every city, a, an ISID um, free, office. Uh, office. So, so can, can a venue apply for a set of licenses, or does it have to be a touring act, or like what are... What no, are according to that new description I showed, uh, anyone that meets that criteria of that description can apply for a license. So Skydome could say, I want these 50. I, I, don't think, I don't think any of the licensing allows you to apply for specific frequencies. Yeah. You can apply for ranges, I believe. Um, and just another thing on licensing, I do a lot of these things in the states that people ask about licensing all the time, and they're always asking about it in the form of protection. You know, if I get a license for my church, am I going to have protection? And the thing is, is like, yeah, you got a license, um, you know, 
we all have protection. If somebody breaks into your house and steals your stuff, you call the police department and they come and they deal with it. Is that something that's going to help you in real time when somebody shows up out front of your church with a, you know, with a 250 milliwatt microphone because somebody just had a car accident out there? No. So, you know, you know, people are looking for some magic literally magic bullet that's going to protect them from, you know, having their, their RF spectrum stepped on. And it's, it's, it's not really a thing. I mean, all it does is, in, in, for example, in a fixed situation like a house of worship, if you had a Part 74 license in the States and somebody next door lit up something that was in spectrum that you had licensed, you would have the, the right to go over there and, and demand that they cease and desist. And then some backing from the FCC could yeah, take so months or the, years or who that's, knows. That's the touring guy talking, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I deal with the broadcasters and, you know, uh, Rogers TV on Dundas Square. Well, they got Hard Rock's gone now, but they had Hard Rock Cafe down the street and a jazz club down the street, et cetera. What a license will do, is, as you were alluding to at the end, is uh, you got a piece of paper and say, these are my frequencies, don't go there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then that maybe doesn't eliminate, but it minimizes possible interference problems, right? So it's, it's a matter of playing well with your neighbors and you get a one-up on, on those neighbors and saying, these frequencies are allocated to me. Right. No, I think, as I, as I said, it has to, the efficiency of a, of a well-run database has to uh, um, well think. run, yes. Yeah, that's key. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, next question, Jeff. Well, just a follow up. How did that work with the the, the pirate TV station here? Did they ever get that guy shut down? Pirate TV. Boy, I'll tell you. Um, Colin and I were talking this afternoon over that that one link about penalties. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's two kinds of penalties. Uh, there's one for individual people and one for corporations and enterprises. <coughs> and then there's also two different types of grievances. If you're in the top level grievance, for example, like running a jammer or an illegal TV station, um, this, the first occurrence is $10 million for a corporation or an enterprise. <laughs> For an individual person, the first occurrence was twenty ten thousand yeah. dollars, and uh, second as much as fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, I did a little anecdote on that. As somebody I was working with this summer, uh, from he does a lot of award shows over in Europe, was telling me that in Milan, Italy, um, they have a lot of illegal television stations that come on the air around nine o'clock in the evening and show porn all night. And, and so when you're in a venue and you do your scan and you get everything set up and it's all working and then right around showtime, oh, uh, you know, on it goes. So like we, we have it, I, I did, <laughs> I, I did, I did hear that there was somebody down in the beaches or somebody that was running a private, is yeah, that where I heard that or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Going? yeah, I don't know, but anyway, I mean, we're 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 like way better off than than other parts of the world in terms of that kind of rogue behavior, so far. No, sure. I think yeah. to answer your question, in terms of a database or possibly an organization that should get involved, um, if anyone here it wants to volunteer to run the <laughs> Canadian database, there's an opportunity. Yeah. No, I, I, they appointed an American company, I can't mention the name, which is the same American company that um, organized the database in, in the USA. Um, I wondered about that. I mean, why necessarily, was it the software that was better? I, I think we have the expertise. Um, but it does take time and some investment. So let me get this right. Industry Canada? Yes. Appointed an American company. Correct. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> Rob? Uh, I've got some cheap recent Iser packs that I use for production because I, I work for another company that has a bunch of collector sonics. Uh, just for an extended production company with pre existing Isers, it seems like we've really just, just gone through this. But I think Sennheiser's, while you were talking, I looked it up, is offering some upgrade packs. 
Sure. We were just <laughs> talking today about this. I, we can extend that program, um, certainly, you know, to at least, I'd say, May 2020. Um, May 2nd. Sir, and the question of how many... May 2nd. Yes. Yeah, how, how many times are we going to have to, like, sell our wireless equipment and start over, or, you know, buy, sell our illegal wireless <laughs> equipment and start over? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, there's varying opinions on that, um, and I'm not going to wade into either of them. My um, take on it is that um, uh, return on investment, or ROI, is king, as they say in France. Sure. Um, and um, um, anyway, so my my take on it is that you know when you're buying wireless equipment look look at a 5 year payoff horizon because if it does happen it happens if it doesn't happen anything after after 5 years you're you know it's basically free money um, my opinion particularly from having been in the touring world is that um, even great equipment that has been used for too long is not that great anymore and um, you get things like, you know, a name brand, great professional microphone where the battery clips are worn out or the little up-down switches are falling off or the display doesn't light up or the, the, you know, never mind the windscreen beat to hell or whatever, just because they get a lot of use. And after six, seven, eight years or something, they're in pretty rough shape. The paint's coming off them, whatever. So, I mean, everybody loves a piece of equipment that they paid for once and they can keep renting for, you know, 30 years. And uh, as do I. But I would just say that in a lot of cases, maybe your wireless equipment is not that stuff. Part, so in direct uh, in response to your question, though, um, uh, there is a law in the U.S. that was passed by Congress when Obama was in called the Middle... Uh, middle class tax relief, um, mm -hmm. where they have basically stated that they are moving the public safety ban, which is 470 to 512. 512 yeah. Yeah. in the uh, 11 or 12 largest cities in the U.S. Uh, elsewhere. That's so Channel and, 14. And, to, uh, yeah, 14 Channel 14. To, to, yeah. To, yeah. So, um, in fact, I, I had a slide on that in, in my in, initial until I had to mm -hmm. cut it down to, to get it in the time constraints. But so 2022, and well, the only thing that can change that is an act of Congress, and we all know how <laughs> pathetic Congress is right now. Um, so it's not likely to change, and uh, it's likely that they will also auction that off. I um, sent a, an email to the uh, I, uh, to Lisa at, at ISET, um, and it went up the chain and came back with public safety in Canada is different than the U.S. Yeah. And they'll keep an eye on what the U.S. does, but it's not likely that they would auction off that same area. I'll only make one comment. Industry Canada was very sensitive to what happened during the 700 megahertz transition because they had a lot of border problems. If the U.S. does uh, uh, sell that spectrum off and we start having telcos in Buffalo or wherever uh, in those frequency ranges, I, I'm not sure if they can just sit there and say we're going to do it differently. Yeah, it's going to be a problem. I mean, you won't even be able to watch your, your Channel 14 on TV over yeah. here. And if you're in Niagara Falls, Canada, and they have this in Niagara Falls, New York, or if you're in Windsor and they have it in Detroit, or uh, Vancouver and they have it in Seattle, it's going to be a problem. And, and in fact, I mean, that's, that's the main reason why the Canadian landscape changed at the same time as the United States landscape because we pretty much had to because they screwed it, up it the doesn't first time. well not just that but it doesn't stop at the border yeah. a and um, I mean you know you do a scan down here on the waterfront and besides all the the channels that Rob so painstakingly put in on that 
that uh, spreadsheet is there's ones coming across the lake too. And, and uh, Reza and I were talking about that the other day, is there is a certain amount of unknown quantity that is going to continue to be unknown quantity. And that is, for example, if you can do a scan now and pick up a channel that's coming from Buffalo or the greater Buffalo area or Rochester or wherever, and it's coming in at, at say, minus 70 or something here, and it's above 608 and it's being moved, you don't really, we won't really know until it gets seeded in its new, you know, below uh, 608 channel slot, how that's going to work. Because maybe they're moving their transmitter site. Maybe they're upgrading their transmitter site. Maybe they are moving the and upgrading their transmitter site, but they're turning it south so that it's you know on the shore of the lake and it's pointing away from us. We don't. Well, some of that stuff is just not going to be known until it actually happens. And the same, another thing is, is that until T-Mobile lights up in Buffalo and lights up in Rochester and Niagara Falls or wherever, wherever. We're not going to know how much of that is going to come across the lake either. So that's um, going to happen pretty soon because yeah. I've been getting phone calls from T-Mobile. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. About when are we converting our Ontario sites? Yes. Right. Sure. And uh, they are yeah. very, they're set, ready to go. Yeah, because uh, they're coordinated with Absolutely. the new plan, not yeah. the old plan. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And just just to address another point that I, I kind of butted in on Rob's thing earlier about this, is that. In the States, we know that T-Mobile bought blocks B and C for probably the majority of the United States and Puerto Rico and blah, 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 blah. Again, it's not as well known who bought blocks A and B and D and E and what parts of the country they're in. And none of those companies are being at all proactive the way T-Mobile has been. T-Mobile has been very engaged with our industry and saying this is what we're doing this is when it's going to turn this is when we're going to light up and so on and so forth none of these other companies i think even know that our industry exists so for example if you're you know if you do a, a scan and block a appears to be open and clean and everything that doesn't really mean anything because it could mean that who you know whatever little regional cellular company or whoever it is bought block a they they might be lighting up at 9:30 tonight you don't know so that's just a kind of another unknown that, that's there, part of like working in the states and or along the border. So keep that. I could mind. stress that's why we have the software, as I showed earlier, mm -hmm. to handle that eventuality, and it can happen very quickly. If that scenario changes, you can handle yeah. that, um, yeah. and that's where our investment is going. That the software can deal with that, and very quickly in real time. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to offer a case study. Jeff Bamford, uh, who's on our, our local executive AES, uh, his church and my church are like three and a half blocks apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And at one point we had some you know, crosstalk of interference or whatever on our systems. Now, is our future going to be that, first of all, we need to buy new systems, second of all, we need to separately <coughs> license each other, and third of all, that some authority will supervise any <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend a license at this stage until well, we've already again that database. You can't get yeah. a license. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, well, no, I mean, no, I, no, you can. They, the, For the churches? They, they, well, between 470 and 608, oh, okay. you could have, uh, they've called it a voluntary license. What you do is, how, how many mics do you have in your church? I, wait, I can answer this. I can answer this because you have every one that the congregation ever bought going back to 1910. So every house of worship I have ever been in has every single wireless system that they have ever bought still lined up there because Pastor A likes this one, Pastor B, and so on. But anyway, sorry, go on. We're in more control. It comes down to frequency coordination. What I'm going to say is you've got a small number of mics. Get together with your neighbor. It's frequency coordination.
Freak, uh, <laughs> turn the power down and frequency coordination. Yeah. I mean, yeah. why why anything is going it's three blocks through a building down the street yeah. is really yeah raises still a large question. Range, but 470 yeah. to 608. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. Do you, Doug McClement. Yeah. What's, what's the worst case test field sand? Is it like Broadway the worst place where it's like 40 theaters and three or four blocks? Or? Well, it's, it's the best case. It's the, it's the best case because it shows that, that people can, can work these problems out well, and so cooperate. If you're working there, that would not be the, the test ground for the, your highest concentration. Yep. Like Prob 40 theaters or 40 mics, each about 1,600 microphones within. Yeah, but but they're also struggling at the same time. I, you know, I mean, yeah, there's the good news. The, the other side is you've got, I mean, Alteros has made gangbusters in New York, specifically because people went, I'm getting out of UHF. Um, and the Sure Axiom, wasn't that a, like, uh, the, the HD mode was done for NBC originally, wasn't it? Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but I mean... Uh, so my, my point is that New York entities that are dealing with wireless mics, they're struggling with it, and so they are looking for alternative approaches to deal with the problem. Not to say that some good design and well-implemented approaches, you know, with a moderate number of channels couldn't... I think the Olympics would be the same thing. The difference is one company, so they can coordinate one guy. Yeah. There's one company dealing with that. huge concentration We've already, we've already pre-coordinated, as I say, with band planning, which I, you know, yeah. sort of on, on Broadway, several large shows, um, 48 channels each, post-auction, and it takes a lot of coordination, but yes, but I mean, the, 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 the rule on Broadway is quite simple, is first in gets preference. So if show XYZ has a set of freaks and a new show comes into that adjacent theater, show uh, X that was in there first doesn't have to change. So that new show would have to coordinate against, etc. And, and they all talk. Yeah, you have to, basically. Yeah. And, and again, so much RF power that is in people's hands is just wasted. It's wasted going three blocks down the street to the other church. And, and it, it's, it's seldom necessary. I mean, you know, when I'm walking around in a back hallway, a concrete hallway with an in-ear pack on, and it's still working, I mean, how, how much power is actually getting to me to make that work, you know? It might be a couple of milliwatts or something by the time it gets there. You know, even on the, the last year that I did the Much Music Video Awards, which was 2014, I think, we had uh, eight in-ear systems on stage A and eight on stage B. And just almost as a lark, when I was prepping them at the shop, shop I just said, I'm going to start with them all out on 10 milliwatts. And by the end of, the, of the, you know, the three days of rehearsal and show night and everything like that, I had changed about maybe four of the 16 up to 50 milliwatts. And the rest of them were just fine. Outdoors, in that, you know, parking lot at the TV station with, you know, all kinds of stuff going on, and they were just fine. So people just think they need more power than they do most of the time. All right. Last question. Uh, just, uh, we're, we're having about five towers of buildings coming up near, near our church. And are there sources of RF going to be coming from those buildings that we're talking about? Just IoT devices, perhaps, or well, if you if you venture into the decked world, that's sort of unknown territory. And decked can have issues with fluorescence. We've had certain um, clients complain about decked. Um, um, that's what DEC stands for, is Digital Electronic Cordless Telephone. Yeah, but it's being used for everything. It's only 10 megahertz of spectrum. Most telephones are no longer using 1.9 gig. They're using other frequencies. Yeah. So you're not, yeah, you're not usually, I mean, I think, I think it's possible that they still sell them that way, but I haven't seen one in a while. Um, um, who's going to buy up all the soon-to-be illegal wireless systems? <laughs> 
The third well, world, question, baby. Good question. Yeah, the, and, and to answer that gentleman's yeah. question is that um, never forget that these frequency ranges that you may have are in, in strong demand in South America, uh, New Zealand, Australia, China. So in many cases, you, you could compare... Amazon what, is your friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just, just and another thing to that. In terms of local... In, like if you have a, a building like a house of worship or something that happens to be sitting between five radio towers or something, um, there's uh, an expression that I have is that power trumps frequency. And the fact is, is that you can occasionally get into an environment that is so... RF hostile that that there is equipment you know that the that the level of equipment that we have access to simply will not work because the noise floor is too high and and some of that is simply because of the amount of, of radiation that's coming off the towers some of it can be because of bad housekeeping with the towers for example like um, if you know whether they're properly grounded to the earth and everything at every single point that they're supposed to be and all that stuff um, but, you know, if you live in or have a, a facility that's in close proximity to a bunch of transmission towers, things can change, <laughs> you know. It doesn't even have to be the antennas. It yeah. could be 5G antennas on top of these buildings. It doesn't even have to be the antennas. It could be the amplifiers. <laughs> will radiate so much noise yeah. that you'll, you'll have problems. As can bad ballasts and street lights, so you know, like, <laughs> or fluorescent lights or LED walls or whatever. So LED walls, yeah, yeah. we're yeah. a major problem. Okay, yeah. uh, thanks very much. Uh, if you have any more questions, you can uh, talk to these guys uh, right afterwards. But I just wanted to wrap it up. Uh, thanks to uh, Art, Rob, and uh, Colin.